What's up everybody, Thralls Metal here once again. I'm the Crack Neck, and I have yet another collection update for you. So I had something else planned to record today, but unfortunately that fell through, namely because I got a cold, and it sucks. It's not the worst, and I'll definitely be better by the time you guys see this, but generally uh, I would be out hanging out with some friends and family today, but I don't want to be patient zero and get them all sick because it seems like the weather might be turning. I don't know, it's Ohio, it's pretty unpredictable. I'm reasonably sure there's probably another snowstorm on the way, but at least for right now, it's nice. So I've got another interesting bundle here of just kind of random stuff, uh, stuff that I missed this year in terms of reviews. There's some stuff that was sent to me, and there's also the stuff that HeadSplit also sent to us that I'm gonna go over in here too. I'm always skulking the distros to see what sort of weird stuff I can find, and yeah, once again, I found some cool stuff, some stuff I've been meaning to get for a while, and uh, yeah, well, let's just get right into this. All right, so we have a two disc set here from Solitude Eternus. We have their third album, Through the Darkest Hour, and their fourth album, Downfall. And I've been meaning to get some Solitude Eternus for a while. They are essentially, I would say, the U.S.'s equivalent to Candlemas. It is that epic Doom style, except with like a little bit of like Texas blues that kind of squeaks in there too. But for the most part, these guys are kind of right on par with Candlemas as far as sound, and that makes a lot of sense because Robert Lowe actually took over in vocals in Candlemas at one point, and King of the Grey Islands, man, that album fucking rips. So anyway, I figured it was time to actually check out some of this band's work, and I saw this in uh, Night Shift's distro, and I decided to pick it up, and well, man, it's pretty fucking solid. Of the two, Through the Darkest Hour is probably my favorite. That has so many great fucking riffs. I like the dark, sinister energy on it. Robert Lowe's vocals are absolutely fantastic. He almost sounds like a more doomy version of Ronnie James Dio in spots, especially on songs like The Eighth Day, Morning. Fantastic, doomy, slow, murky song. I love how dreary it sounds and how it plays well off of The Ninth Day, Awakening, which is... Kind of a riffy, chuggy bastard of a song. You even get some more like Middle Eastern or Indian flashes because there is an actual sitar, I believe, on the ninth day. And it adds a lot to the atmosphere, which the atmosphere, of course, is gloomy but epic because that is exactly what this band does well. The production is fantastic. I absolutely love the guitar tone. It is thick, it's hefty. Kind of reminiscent of Crowbar in terms of just the overall fucking weight of it. And the bleak guitar harmonies that are all over this are just fucking amazing. The only issue I think I had with this was the song Pain, which, I don't know, kind of has some odd transitions on it. Like, the song doesn't flow very well, and then it kind of just abruptly cuts off. Now, that might be a tracking issue with this print of uh, these CDs, but the song kind of feels like it just quits. Like, just, fuck you, I'm done this is where the song ends, deal with it. Again, that might just be an issue with this version of Through the Darkest Hour, but outside of that, dude, that album is absolutely killer. I was a huge fan of it. Now, Downfall is a little bit different. The production's a little bit murkier, and Robert Lowe's vocals on it are different. He kind of, you know, drops down a register. There's not as much high wailing. Actually, a lot of the vocals kind of had like a kind of like mid-register sort of hard rock vibe. Like there's even some harmonies on it that are very comparable to Alice in Chains. There's still some more like doom-laden jams like Together and Wither and Midnight Dreams where it definitely sounds more like their earlier material with the more doom metal sound. But a lot of this is kind of just like a heavy rock vibe and a lot of it is really kind of going for like the big chorus hooks. Chapel of Burning, Death Wish, and These Are the Nameless all kind of go for like a big hook. and it, it kind of lands sometimes, like I think Chapel of Burning might be like kind of the weaker of the three that I mentioned there because the hook just doesn't necessarily land as hard as the other ones. Death Wish is a very short, kind of more up-tempo rocker, and it's got a solid hook to it. Like, it's a fun song. It kind of feels really different from anything I heard before this, but it's still really well done, so... Not really much of an issue there. The only song I thought was just really strange was the song Elysium, which is, I don't know, more of like a weird effects-driven spacey song. Like the guitars are more fuzzy, more kind of like a desert rock Caius sort of vibe. And the vocals have this really weird filter. Like if you remember the original version of The Fly with the person stuck in the web, like, uh, like it, it's kind of a warbled effect and it's just weird and off-putting and the song kind of makes no sense like it's just sort of a weird 
kind of transitional track that I don't know, just kind of screams filler. I still liked Downfall, but a lot of it felt more reserved and again, more focused on accessibility rather than creativity, I guess. But overall, I'd say check out both. I think Through the Darkest Hour is fucking fantastic. Like that's a killer album. I definitely want to get more of their early stuff, but Downfall definitely has its moments too. But yeah, either way, check this out. Solid epic doom metal. If you're a giant Candlemass fan, I just really can't see and not liking some of this. Like honestly, I slept in this band for a long period of time. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely kind of late to this one, but yeah, really dig this. So yeah, check it out. Keel Hall. Keel Hall's triumphant return to obscurity. This is the fourth album from this Cleveland-based hardcore sludge metal, uh, stoner metal. I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to classify, but when you listen to it, uh, you'll definitely get callbacks to, I would say, Converge, early Mastodon, maybe a little bit of early Cave-In, and definitely the band Nut. Now this one's kind of overdue for me because uh, we've been big fans of the band Axioma, and that actually features Aaron Donaldson, who is in this band, and this is kind of where he got his start in terms of the Cleveland scene. And I've been meaning to get some Keel Hall, saw this one, and picked it up, and holy shit, this album is absolutely nuts. This is very spastic sludge metal. It's very high energy. Like, there's definitely some groovy spots, but most of this is just very kind of, well, uh, Braun Daler-ish drums and weird angular riffs and dissonant melodies that don't necessarily make sense sometimes in terms of like a first listen, but you get back to it like, oh, wow, no, that really works very cleverly. Vocally, it's very minimalist. In fact, I would say most of this album is instrumental, which is fun because a lot of the songs kind of feel very free flowing. Like they're just kind of going wherever the song takes them and it takes them into weird territory with very strange song titles because yeah some of them are just kind of nuts like uh opening tracks called past the lampshade definitely been to some parties like that but uh i like the one everything's a napkin which is an interesting theory i don't know how true it is though in terms of napkin related songs I thought that one was pretty interesting because it reminded me of another sludge band with another interesting uh, napkin-related song title. The band American Heritage has a wonderful little number in one of their albums called It's Like Fucking a Napkin Full of Toenails. I shit you not, that is one of the titles on that album, and um, I'm not here to kink shame, but I feel like I probably should on that if that's your kink. But outside of uh, napkins, this band is also very comparable to American Heritage. Lots of like Melvins-ish songwriting where there's really not like a, you know, chorus or, you know, verses necessarily. It's just, again, sort of this free-flowing sort of song. Great groovy moments, especially on, sorry, I have to open this up, uh, High Seas Viking Eulogy. Well, one of my favorites on here. But honestly, one of my favorite tracks is the last track, KFB, which I think they wrote a song to a drunk man's rant. Like, you have this whole rant from... Someone that is clearly very, very intoxicated going off about a whole bunch of shit. But the music itself sounds like it was written around his rant. Like where he perks up and starts yelling, the song gets more intense. The notes kind of follow his <laughs> very interesting meter in terms of telling the story. It's just a really creative sort of approach to uh, just writing a weird fucking song. And honestly, that's kind of the thing on this. It's just a fun album. In terms of like the musicianship, I love it. It's absolutely amazing. All the musicians on here are doing a killer job, especially the drummer. The drummer is fucking nuts on here. Like again, very comparable to Bron Daler, who is, well, he's fucking Bron Daler. I definitely need to get more by Keel Hall. This is grossly entertaining. Just a ridiculous album. Unfortunately, I think this is their last one. I don't know if this band is necessarily still active. I know Axioma is definitely active, and I believe they are working on new material. So at least as far as Donaldson goes, he's definitely busy right now. But regardless, I definitely want more, whether it's something new or just the albums I'm missing from this band. This is absolutely fantastic. If you're a fan, again, of like Melvin's early Mastodon, Nut, stuff like that, definitely check this out. It's a fucking wild listen. All right, we have a split here between Unita and Dozer. This is the Best of Wayne Grow split from 1999 between two stoner rock bands. And, well, all right, Unita, uh, fairly well known in terms of like the whole Desert Rock Underground. It is yet another one of John Garcia's post-Caius projects, much like Slow Burn. In fact, I think 
This was the next band after Slow Burn, which was very, you know, short-lived. And I think only put out the one EP, which I own, and it was really good. I think this one was kind of like born out of like jam sessions. I think Scott Reeder was actually involved too, also of Caius. And this is just straight up desert rock, stoner metal, very much along the lines of literally anything John Garcia fronts because he's got a particular sound he goes for. Fuzzy guitars, kind of spacey atmosphere, big rock grooves, and of course his fucking awesome vocals, which, I mean, he kills it on like every album he's on. You only get four songs a piece from each band here. My favorite probably from the Unia side is Delta, Alba, Plex. It's a little bit heavier, a little bit more urgent, like it's got some big massive riffs on it. Uh, Wet Pussycat, <laughs> I wonder what he's talking about there. Pretty good song too, like more of a, just a straightforward rocker, lots of uh, repeated refrains in that. I mean, as far as, again, like John Garcia's output, it's all kind of similar just because, I mean, his vocals are so distinct, but he also goes for, again, a very distinct sound. Like there was a long period after Caius where he was just doing multiple projects that sounded just like Caius. You need a fucking included. Actually, I think the next one in line was uh, Hermano and Hermano sounds a lot like fucking Caius too. But yeah, their side's really solid, pretty much exactly what I expected. And then the other band, Dozer, is from Sweden. And well, <laughs> they sound like Caius. They sound, well, I guess like Unita too, and Hermano and Slowburn. Both of these bands sound very similar. Now, I do like Dozer's production a little bit more. It's a little bit more warm and fuzzy, and I think the bass is more prominent on it. And the guitars overall are a little bit thicker. Like on Unita's side, it's a little bit more of like a heavy rock tone with like that stoner metal warmth. These are notably thicker and a bit heavier. But in terms of like uh, stylistic differences between the two bands, this is not much. They sound very similar, albeit with different production. Even down to the vocals, because Dozer's frontman kind of sounds a bit like John Garcia. Like, I don't think he gets up as high, but in terms of, like, their delivery, pretty damn close. My personal favorite from Dozer's side, though, is Calamari's side trip. It's the kind of spacier, weirder of the two. Like, I just kind of like the atmosphere and such, and it's just a good stoner rock song. I like this split, but both bands kind of sound a little too similar, so I kind of just feel like I'm listening to the same band, albeit with like some slightly different production. Both are good though, and if you like, I mean, anything John Garcia has been in, I would say almost ever, you're probably gonna really dig this. It's not quite as good as Caius, but few things are. I mean, Welcome to Sky Valley, I would say is like a stoner metal fucking classic, and it doesn't even fucking sniff that. But either way, if you see this one around in news bins, because this came out in 1999 on Meteor City Records, which I don't even think that label exists anymore, pick it up. It's a good time. It's just riffs and stoner metal atmosphere, and that's kind of what I want out of the whole sound. So yeah, check it out. Hell Ripper, Coagulating Darkness. This is the first album from this one-man Scottish black and thrash metal wrecking crew. We recently went over his or theirs. Again, like with a band name, I think they, but it's one dude. Anyway, we went over the last album. It's absolutely amazing. This was the only full length I was missing. And guess what? It's also awesome. I like how just foot on the gas this is. This is like kill them all sped up and with like a hefty dose of venom just kind of thrown in it. And it's just all ferocious attitude, great riffs and killer lead work. And I love it. Just like I love all of L Ripper stuff so far. Now I will admit like the new album I think is probably his best yet, mainly because Songwriting dynamics are even stronger on that one. And he still retained all the things that I love about the sound, like that sort of like toxic Holocaust, kind of just straight for the throat style. But his riff work is notably more fast and more intricate. And the lead work on it is fucking top notch. Like the dude is just shredding everywhere. And the pace of this album is breakneck. There are some, you know, groovier pockets for you to kind of like slow down and bang your head to, but this is out to wreck next, especially the three song run from hell, black invocation and conduit closing. Holy shit. I think I tweaked something in my neck, actually just jamming this in my basement. These songs are so furious and fucking fun that you can't help but to headbang. And 
the machine gun riffs that are all over here just kind of just get the blood fucking boiling. I love that about this band. I would say the last track, the title track, is probably the most different out of all of them. It's a little bit punkier in spots, but kind of like punk played by Celtic Frost because the black metal energy kind of comes out more. Overall, I would say this band is mostly thrash metal with black metal as sort of a seasoning, but man, on Coagulating Darkness, the black metal side comes out, you have more cold tremolo riffs, there's some blast beats in there. A lot of this is more of like a thrash metal pace, like that steady D beat gallop, but hearing some blast beats sort of peppered in there and a little bit more of the black metal side come out, albeit maybe a little late in the album, definitely added like a little bit more depth to it. But honestly, I don't need much depth for me to like this. This is just fucking fun. I love every riff on here. This is pretty much something I would put on in my car if I wanted to get from point A to point B very, very quickly and hopefully with no cops along the way because this will make me speed. Like that is sort of the natural reaction to it. I mean, The Affair of the Poison is pretty much the same thing for me too, but yeah, this is fucking fantastic and I'm so glad I finally got this. If you have not checked out Hell Ripper yet, I would say maybe start with the new one, or I don't know, just get any one of their three or his three albums, they're all really good. The new one, definitely a little bit more on the dynamic side, but it still packs all the ferocity of the earlier work, but those first two albums, if you just want something fast and relentless and fucking fun, definitely check them out. Absolutely amazing band, just go get it. Reburied, Repulsive Nature. This is the debut album from the Seattle-based death metal act. Came out this year on Translation Lost Records. I heard a lot of buzz about this band, and we kind of missed our opportunity to review it. I think we reviewed something else instead, just because we wanted to you know, branch out past you know death metal. But um, kind of wish we had reviewed this, because this is really fucking good. Straightforward, old school death metal. It's meat potatoes, but there's a lot of cool flashy writing in it. Love the guitar tone. It is actually huge massive. I mean, there's a big Morbid Angel vibe to it in terms of like the overall sort of thickness and murkiness of it. The vocals on here are fantastic and this one definitely has a bit of that hardcore infused death metal like, you know, Frozen Soul, Creeping Death, stuff like that. And I like how the vocals kind of showcase it a bit because it's definitely a hardcore delivery but with like a death metal style. It's lower, it's gross, it's, you know, just solid gutturals but there's that sort of force that comes behind it in terms of the delivery that kind of gives it a hardcore bite. But yeah, this band kind of just checks off a lot of things that I like in death metal, and I think the writing is nice and varied. Like, the title track has good doomy harmonies, there's really good sections of like isolated bass on it. Planetary Obliteration kind of picks up the pace a little bit with some blast beats, which this isn't just a blast beat fest, like, I would say it's mostly more groove oriented. And I particularly like the Jaws theme like chugs on that song like it's a good tension build. I mean, it's kind of a classic tension build I still hear that in my head anytime I get in the ocean, which is fucking never lots of catchy riffs really good accents on them to really make them stand out I even didn't mind the interlude on here dismal hallucinations It actually has some really cool horror synths and then like a clean guitar melody on top of it and it actually kind of transitions to the next track really well, so there's an interlude I can't fucking bitch about. It really works. Honestly, it's a pretty short release too. There's only one track on here that goes over the four minute 30 mark. But honestly, that's really not a complaint either because this is very direct, straight to the point. I like that it doesn't mill about trying to build way too much atmosphere or anything like that. Like this is just good, straightforward death metal. And even with a interlude on it, the interlude actually really works well. And it was really good about introducing different elements as the album went along. Like one of the last tracks in here, Throne of Asmodeus, even throws in a really nasty slam breakdown, which I don't think really popped up anywhere else on this album. This is really solid. Like this is some pretty damn good death metal here. I'd say if you're a big fan of like Creeping Death, I would even say like Tomb Mold too. Definitely check this out. This is just gross old school death metal. And what's not to love about that? So yeah, check it out. Jesus Peace, Only Self. This is the debut album from this Philly-based hardcore act. Tons of buzz around these guys. I've really liked the singles that I've heard from their upcoming album, which comes out next month. And uh, yeah, I decided it was time to pick up their first album and holy shit, this band's fucking heavy. Definitely very similar to bands like Knocked Loose, but I would say with their vocalist Aaron Hurd, there is a little bit more like death metal energy to it because his delivery is just 
raw and ferocious and unlike Knock Loose, not as high register, like it's more of a low kind of death metal roar. I mean, his vocal guest spot worked so well in Sanguisugabog that I almost couldn't tell the transition between him and Devin. This whole album is groovy and violent. Lots of breakdowns, lots of cool bending, sliding riffs on here, but there's also a fair amount of atmosphere and like build up to songs. And I really like that. Like in the short amount of time that these songs hang out, because most of them are very short. In fact, this whole album is also very short. They do a good job of building tension and releasing it in some of the most violent music I've heard in hardcore in a while. Well, I mean, we did just jam that new Cruelty and that's pretty fucking violent, but it's kind of right on that level. Now, unfortunately, this is another one where I just wrote down one word in the fucking track title and they didn't have them listed on the back. So I'm going to have to wing it on pretty much all the tracks that I had highlighted. But I know the song uh, Nero Prison, that might have been one word, and Dog and Curse might have had other words in those too but i didn't write them down all had some like more straightforward death metal elements i want to say the song dog even has like kind of a big slow down sort of like almost sort of slam breakdown at the end that's just absolutely fucking devastating and again even in these shorter songs they know how to bring in a touch of atmosphere to sort of mood set it a little bit like the song silence there might have been another word there but that's the only one i wrote down that one has a really cool ambient beginning before it absolutely explodes. And then the last two songs, which I know got right because they're simply known as Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. One is essentially a long ambient track. It's just dark layers of noise. And then two sort of just turns into like a really heavy post metal song, like something a little bit more along the lines of like, I would say early Cult of Luna. It's very dissonant very dark and gloomy. And a lot of this album is more about like the hostility. So it's kind of cool to hear like more of a range of emotions in it. But yeah, this was absolutely fantastic. And I gotta say like this band is like on the same level of heaviness as a lot of death metal acts. Like this has just an absolutely brutal fucking vibe to it. Can't wait for the new one. Like I'm, I'm super stoked after listening to this. This is just a badass album. This is some no bullshit, groovy, beat down hardcore, and I dig it. And I just noticed the songs are actually written on the uh, front here. So, yeah. Uh, man, I hate when bands just try to, like, fuck with you and not put them on the back. But yeah, it was Curse of the Serpent and In the Silence. Those were the ones that I didn't write down fully on here. Anyway, this whole album is awesome. Definitely check it out. Definitely gonna review the new one when it drops. But yeah, this is uh, sick, and I can definitely see why there was a lot of hype around this band, and I would say still a fair amount of hype. So yeah, check it out. Moiscus, Idiomorphic Practices. Now we're getting into the stuff that we got from Headsplit. This is the fourth EP from this Dayton-based Brutal Death Metal slash Grindcore act. Honestly, I heard more Brutal Death Metal on here than Grindcore, but the songs are very short. In fact, I would say most of them are under two minutes, and that's a pretty fucking Grindcore thing, but... Stylistically, this is definitely more along the lines of brutal death metal, right down to the big obnoxious piccolo snare that I still can't get into for the life of me. But uh, the riffs on here are, oh, man, like <laughs> pretty much like mortician levels of heaviness. I had a hunch this one would be an exceptionally brutal one and just sort of a fun one just because the song titles are... Ah, uh, man, absolutely nuts. Like the first track, the normalization of a personality through numerical modeling of casual effects by conscious intention. I have no idea what any of that fucking means, but uh, that is the opening track. And when they're not strange and maybe oddly existential, sometimes they're just uh, weird or gross. Like track six, nasal lube. I don't even wanna know what that's being used for. Or uh, number nine, smothered, covered, and chunked. Pretty sure he's not talking about how he likes his waffles there. And 10, fecal transplantation, which I believe is an actual procedure. And it's also kind of gross when you think about it. Actually, it's really gross when you think about it. But musically, this is absolutely primal. If it is not blasting, it is doing these slow, nasty, lumbering chugs. Kind of similar to, you know, Sanguisigabog, except in short form and definitely more blasty. Definitely on par with the uh, 
Sigma Sigma Bug's love for obnoxious snare drums. But in terms of songwriting, they're definitely more about just the blast beats, the guttural vocals. Like this definitely feels a lot more like straightforward mortician worship, maybe minus all the samples. And the fact that this is a real drummer, Outside of that, no, very, very much like Mortician. Again, I will say there's not much in the way of grind here, at least in terms of like the style itself, like even the riff progressions kind of feel more like brutal death metal. Like there's a lot of stuff in here that reminded me of Mutal Latred, which, you know, great hometown band here. But just in terms of just being savage and brutal and not necessarily very like punky, because I think with grindcore, you gotta have a little bit of that punk background. But what I do like is that sort of like self-aware weird humor that is kind of all over this. And the groovy, more slammy sort of sections on here are pretty fucking well done. Now this is 10 tracks in about 14 minutes. So yeah, it's very brief, but honestly, like, I didn't like the snare, that, that kind of drove me nuts after a while, but musically, this was all right. Like I think maybe mixed a little bit differently, at least maybe for my taste, like if you're a big slam, brutal death metal fan, like you'll probably really dig that obnoxious piccolo <laughs> snare. But to me, it was kind of nails on a chalkboard there. But uh, honestly, this was pretty decent. So yeah, if you like bands like Tango Sergabog and Mortician and Metal Atrid, I would say definitely check this band out. This is a pretty gnarly EP. Prehistoric War Cult, Under the Sign of the Red Moon. This is the second EP from this German black and death metal act. Uh, I had a hunch it might be war metal, which I'm kind of on the fence about. And honestly, even though the front man literally says war metal, like is the first words that come out on this, uh, honestly, I think it definitely has more just straightforward black and death metal to it. Like it doesn't necessarily have the whole war metal sound. They definitely have some war metal names, that's for sure. Like Battle Druid, who is the bassist, and Bestial Bone Crusher, who's the drummer, and Poison Drinker, who definitely needs a different fucking hobby, but he's also the guitarist and singer. But again, war metal, I pretty much expect noisy, just very distant, chaotic, blast beat driven, insanity. Like, you know, I, I listen to some war metal bands, like I think, like Diocletian's probably the one that I would go back to the most. But honestly, listening to this, it's got more tropes of like just straightforward death metal that I like. Lots of deep tremolo riffs, there's groovy pockets, there's atmosphere that isn't just like dissonant noise. The vocals do a good switch between high and low register screams and growls. I like that there are pockets of groove on here. There are some really solid fucking riffs too. And it can be decidedly catchy too. Like the song Effigies of Ecstasy has killer fucking breakdown on it. Like there's just a solid riff to it. And the song Inutterable Expressions too. Some absolutely killer fucking riffs on there. Probably my favorite two tracks on here were the songs Spirits of War Awakening and Fever Dreams. Spirits is more of a build up to Fever Dreams. It's more tribal percussion, lots of atmosphere. It's very haunting and creepy, but kind of like in a cheesy 80s horror movie sort of way. So of course I fucking loved it. But Fever Dreams, that riff sounded really familiar, like right away. It kind of sounds like the riff to Orgasmatron. And I love that song by Motorhead. It's more of like a novelty track, but it's got a great droning sort of riff to it. And I really dig that. They do tweak it a little bit. Like it's not 100% them just sort of uh, leasing that one but it's really solid. And honestly, this whole album was, and when I saw that it was possibly war metal, I was like, uh, this is probably gonna be one that I'm not into. But honestly, out of the entire batch from Headsplit, this was probably the one that I dug the most. And I was a little surprised by it. This is just awesome black and death metal. I would say maybe it's not war metal exactly. Again, it shares some of the tropes of it, but for the most part, this is, I would say like closer to like Mormon Angel and like Incantation with like a bit of a black and edge to it. Really solid album though. Like it's just killer riffs, killer atmosphere. Just flat out fucking dig it. So yeah, if you like, well, uh, black and death metal, I would say just check this out because it's pretty fucking gnarly. Torture Rack, Pit of Mutilation. This is a comp from this Portland based caveman death metal act. I actually own their first two albums and it's just gloriously unga bunga, knuckle dragging, riffs and beatdowns. Now this comp includes their first demo, Medieval Mutilation, and their most recent EP, Pit of Limbs. 
and both were pretty much the only things I was really missing from this band. Now this band at one point featured Pierce Williams of Skeletal Remains on guitars in here, but he has since left to focus on all of his other musical ventures, which he's got a lot, and <laughs> they're, they're all really fucking good from what I've heard. So yeah, I, I guess he kind of had to sacrifice one, but I believe this band is still going on. But yeah, this is absolutely foul and disgusting and that is even in comparison to the two full lengths that I own. Now the demo is raw. It is so damn raw. It is gainy, crispy, just gross and disgusting. Like it has that deep fried sort of bass and guitar tone to it where it just sort of crackles and hisses. Like it's not necessarily like an HM2 buzzsaw. Like it just sounds broken and ugly, but it totally fucking works. Now all the songs on that one can also be found on their debut, Barbaric Persecution. Solid fucking album, but if you want to hear them in their more foul and murky sort of state with added bleh, there's a lot of extra bleh to the vocals on this one, then this is exactly where to find it. Now honestly, I expected the Pit of Limbs EP to be, you know, a little bit less raw, and honestly, it's better produced, but it's just as raw. In fact, I would say the guitars get even more crunchy and filthy. Like the guitars on their full lengths sound murky and full. These sound just sort of crispy and fucking gross. And gross kind of works with the uh, song titles, especially the, <laughs> the fifth one, which is the opening track on Pit of Limbs, Cadaver Come. You'd figure that'd be more like dust since it's all dried out, but I don't want to go too deep into this because Again, gross. The songs are very short. They're very abrasive and fast. Honestly, with like the sort of production values mixed with the songwriting style, it sounds like early exhumed covering Bloodbath half the time. And that's, I don't know, pretty cool in my fucking book. I love the D beat section on Lord of the Mass Grave. Pretty fucking catchy song. And surprisingly, the last song, Mace Face, had decidedly different production. So I don't know if that one was actually recorded separately from the rest of the tracks. But either way, this is just an absolutely gross and foul collection of songs from a gross and foul band that I fucking love. It's brutal, relentless, and yeah, it drags its knuckles all over your fucking eardrums, which is a weird sentence to say out loud, but uh, I fucking said it. Now, hopefully this band continues on. They find a new guitarist because I would love to hear more from them. But yeah, this is just an absolutely gross compilation. I still recommend their two full lengths. They're both absolutely fucking disgusting. But if you want to hear them at their most raw, it is definitely this comp, so I strongly recommend this one. I imagine that Headsplit Records probably has copies of this. If they don't, I'd be really surprised. But yeah, check this out. If you like your death metal particularly just gross and rotten as hell, this is definitely that. So yeah, check it out. Unspeakable, Gaze Upon the Yellow Sign. This is the first EP from the St. Louis-based Blackened death metal act. This band actually features a member of Horns and Hooves, which we went over their last album, and Spite in it. And going over this, you know, of course it says it was Blackened death metal. Of course, I look at archives and just to figure out what I'm going to get into. And I think they might have got this one wrong because this feels more like Blackened thrash metal. There's definitely some more heavy death metal centric moments on here, but a lot of this is D beats, thrashy riffs and just sort of a punky sort of vibe to it. Like there's a lot of stuff in here that sounds like, you know, Venom and Midnight kind of, you know, squeezed into a more abrasive style than what they do. It might be more of like an early death metal vibe, like, you know, Scream Bloody Gore or, you know, uh, Seven Churches, something like that, where it was a little bit more thrashy, but I get a lot of punk, especially on songs like Black Candles, uh, the song Strange Moons and, the song Le Sorcerer, Le Sorcerer, The Sorcerer, The Sorcerer, that's what we're going to call it because we're not good at French. The production is very raw, very gritty, and honestly, it's one of those things where this sounds like this is what you're going to get live, and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fucking fun live. Despite this being like more up-tempo and kind of that like loose, kind of thrashy fun that, again, you would hear in like, you know, Venom and maybe like a little bit of like Midnight, Toxic Holocaust I would say would be in there too. Towards the end with the last two tracks, Seductress of Dark Spells and Strange Moons, they do incorporate some more extreme metal moments like you get some blast beats, Seductress actually slows it down, kind of feels a little bit more doomy and ominous. So even despite this being sort of a short EP, like there are some really cool dynamics on here. I dug this, I thought this was really fun. Again, a little bit more thrashy than it is death metal, but either way, 
just a fun listen overall. Great riffs, great energy. And again, it kind of sounds like this would be a fucking fun band to see live. So yeah, if you like Midnight, Toxic Holocaust, maybe like Early Death, Early Possessed, uh, Venom, stuff like that, definitely check this EP out. It's a fun one. Host 9 or Roman numeral 9 or IX, however you want to say it. This is the debut album from Paradise Lost's Nick Holmes and Gregor McIntosh in terms of their more goth rock or dark synth sort of project. Lots of dreary 80s worship, we'll just put it like that. And part of me is reasonably sure that they named it after their uh, pretty divisive album host, and it is kind of a continuation of that sound, albeit I would say more classic influences on here. I love this album. This is absolutely fantastic, dreary, just sort of dark Depeche Mode, Human League, Sisters of Mercy stuff. Lots of synths, lots of lush, atmospheric, dreary playing. Occasionally a little bit heavy, but it's more of like a heavy alternative vibe rather than metal. Like maybe more akin to a band like Killing Joke than, well, definitely Paradise Lost. I mean, there's definitely some elements that cross over between the two because, of course, you have two of the members. But I like that... They kind of took what they did on Host and One Second and Symbol of Life. There was kind of a run there for a while, but they channeled it into a new project. And even you know, reading some interviews with Gregor and Nick, they still really enjoyed what they did with the more like alternative industrial, you know, whatever they were doing era. And honestly, I really like that too. So it was kind of cool to hear them, you know, approach it once again, but bring in more classic influences because. I think at that point they were trying to sound modern, like a lot of Nine Inch Nails and like Stabbing Westward comparisons, I guess you could make some of that material. This sounds, again, more classic, and you still have like some of the Nine Inch Nails sort of sounds that pop up in here, but I really dig this. This is a dark, moody album. The song Tomorrow Sky is absolutely infectious. It feels like a lost Depeche Mode song. A Troubled Mind is another standout for me. I like how it mixes more like organic elements like acoustic guitars and such with all the electronic elements on here. I believe all the drums are programmed on here, but there's a lot of different settings and different sounds they explore in it to kind of capture different moods on here. And moods are a big thing on here. And most of the moods are dark and dreary and depressing, but man, are they catchy as hell. Nick Holmes, I love his dreary baritone voice. He does have some like slightly more higher register stuff in here, but a lot of it is that almost sort of like Pete Murphy sort of delivery where it's just sort of down in the fucking dumps and it is absolutely catchy as hell. I absolutely love this and I kind of knew I would. I liked all the singles. Divine Emotion was particularly catchy too. But hearing this whole album, honestly, it's nothing but quality material. I loved every fucking song in it. It has a great vibe throughout it. I mean, I'm a sucker for Depeche Mode stuff, so this was pretty damn close on a lot of fronts. And when it wasn't Depeche Mode, it was, again, like Sisters of Mercy and like the drearier side of Nine Inch Nails and stuff like that. It's just a great album. And honestly, again, I like the fact that they reapproached that, you know, transitional sound that they hit in the uh, 90s and kind of came back to it with, I don't know, just maybe renewed vigor. If you're a big Depeche Mode fan, Sisters of Mercy fan, even say like Nine Inch Nails too, Definitely check this out. This is gloomy, gothy fucking wonderfulness done by some absolute fucking professionals when it comes down to that shit. Albeit in a heavier fashion. Usually, this is amazing. Depeche Mode fans especially, you've been put on notice. Definitely check this out. It's fucking awesome. Aftermath, Eyes of Tomorrow. This is the debut album from this Chicago-based technical thrash act. Came out in 1994. And I gotta... I gotta talk about this album cover <laughs> real quickly just because the more I looked at it, the more I had to giggle to myself and hopefully you're gonna giggle along with me because I have one of two theories about this album cover, which you can see much better over there. One, this little part down here uh, is either this chrome gentleman's junk and he is very proud of it. Notice the smile on his face. And he's just showing off that uh, he just had it polished and it's ready for whatever it's ready for. Or it's like his son and his son is looking up to him with these really weird kind of googly eyes and kind of giving him the 
are you proud of me, Papa, look? In which he's smiling, so, uh, I mean, I guess he is. Either way, like I said, it's weird cyborg dick or weird cyborg child. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was kind of hard to focus on the album at times because I kept looking back at the cover and going, what the fuck was the idea here? Like, there was definitely a love for H.R. Geiger here, but they just kind of didn't get the weird sexual energy that's in a lot of his work right. Or maybe they did. I don't know what you're into, but uh, this album cover is strange. Anyway, musically, this is pretty wild. Very adventurous, riff-driven, just sort of insane technical thrash. Not necessarily like the fastest thrash, like there's sections where it does speed up, it's more groove-laden. Honestly, more akin to bands like Watchtower, I would even say Atheist at times. Lots of just insane guitar work. And weird vocals. The vocals on here are just sort of strange. They're not really sung, they're not really screamed, they're kind of talked aggressively. The song Being on here actually features, I guess what I could describe as rapped vocals. Um, it, I feel like they were just trying a whole bunch of different approaches and a whole bunch of different vocal filters to see what actually matched up with the music. So much to the point where I feel like this may have been intended to be an instrumental album and they just decided to throw on vocals at the last minute just to give it vocals. And honestly, it's kind of a distraction because the music on here is fantastic. Very well written, lots of cool clean parts, lots of like just fantastic shredding. The song structure has a lot of that jazz fusion sort of looseness to it. But whenever the vocals are on, a, they're out front and, you know, kind of hard to ignore, and B, they just don't fit. Like, at no point on here did I think any vocal melody really fit. In fact, again, the vocals aren't necessarily very melodic on here. But as far as songs, like, Reflecting Pictures is a nice heavier number. Experience is almost sort of manic in terms of its transitions from, like, more dreary, kind of soft material to, like, more punchy, heavy material. Whisper of a Dream is awesome. Proud Reflex is another sick number on here. Like, all the songs in here are really well done. It's just I don't get the vocals. And I don't think any of this really needed vocals. Like, there's nothing on here where I think it begs for, like, a big vocal hook. A lot of the songs kind of flow like instrumental songs anyway. Like, you know, more like a Blotted Science album or something like that, or Spastic Ink. So I have sort of a mixed feeling on this one. Like, I love the music, but the vocals really take me out of it. But overall, I would still say definitely check this out, especially if you like really well-played technical thrash or technical death thrash or whatever. Like, it definitely has elements of both, but I would say mostly thrash. Just check it out. The musicianship is amazing. The songwriting is solid. The vocals are there. They exist, and that is probably the nicest thing I can say about them. But again, it's definitely worth listening to just for the music. So yeah, check it out. Overlord. Fake Salvation. This is the debut album from this German death metal act. This actually features Johann de Jaeger. I'm not entirely sure I said your name right, but um, he is actually the guy that runs the Into the Pit YouTube channel. He actually got a hold of me a while ago and asked if he could send me a copy of his album. And I was like, fuck yeah. That's generally how I am. I, I like when people send me stuff. It's, it's pretty damn cool that people respect my opinion enough to actually send me a piece of their work. And this is just some nasty, old-school, riff-driven death metal. Now, this is a two-man project. Johan actually does everything uh, musically. Guitar is bass. I think the drums are programmed. And then he has uh, a vocalist on here who has a really solid delivery, like very much an old-school death metal delivery. It's kind of low and gurgly, but he's very clear in terms of his delivery. Like, you can make out almost every word. This is quite a batch of riffs. I really dig the riff work on here. The guitar tone is crunchy to the fucking max. Like, it is super aggressive. But I will say there's some issues with production on here. Namely, I think some songs feel like they are produced differently, and a lot of it comes down to the drums. Like, if the drums are programmed on here, I feel like the settings change occasionally from song to song. Like, the mix between the first two tracks, Shock and Awe and Counter-Strike, Shock and all, I could barely hear the drums, and then the next track, I can totally hear them. And then sometimes, like, the snare setting sounds a little bit different. Sometimes the bass drum gets kind of bogged out at times. So it did kind of hamper the listen. Musically, I would say this is very on par with, like, early death 
or, you know, uh, Inhuman Condition or Massacre. You know, take your pick between the two. But there's a lot of thrashy energy to a lot of the songs, especially the title track on here. But this definitely packs a ton of solid riffs on here. Mental Monstrosity I thought was really good. Perpetual Torment killer riffs. I really enjoyed the droning breakdown riff on Hideous Reprisal and Stabbing Frenzy definitely has some like more brutal elements to it. I will say though this also runs a bit long. This runs almost 58 minutes and there's a lot of stuff that I think sort of overlaps in terms of all right you have quite a few songs in here that have a similar vibe. There's some ones that could have been like scrapped more as like bonus tracks in here. And even within songs, some of them are just a bit long. Like I want to say Eradicated was close to eight minutes, if not more. I know there's a track on here that was about eight minutes. And while it's good, packs a lot of riffs, it just feels like it repeats a lot of stuff too much. And while it does repeat elements that I really enjoy, it just kind of hangs on them a little bit too long. But overall, this was pretty solid. The production issues kind of make it a little bit difficult to listen to. Again, if that was just evened out more, I would probably have less problems. And then again, like trim off some of this, like a tight 40 minute runtime. And this would be an absolute fucking beast of just flat out old school death metal. So thank you, Johan, for sending me this. I really appreciate that. You got a good fucking foundation here. You know, just in my opinion, needs a little bit of work. And for everyone else, like I said, if you like old school death metal, again, death, maybe like a little bit like thrashier death metal, like malevolent creation and shit like that too. Definitely check this out. It is a gnarly listen. Bastard Grave, Vortex of Disgust. This is the third album from this Swedish death metal act. I actually own their first two albums. I was a huge fan of them. I still am a huge fan of them actually. And this one's a little bit different. Now their first two albums definitely have more of that classic Stockholm sound, like the guitars are a little bit more buzzsaw-y and it just has all the tropes of just you know like entombed and dismember and all that wonderful shit this one gets a little bit groovier a little bit more death doomy at times and the tone they kind of changed around a little bit it's more close to like grave's tone like grave had decidedly more of a like a metallic crunch like it didn't sound as dirty as like entombed and dismember did early on but it still sounded gross as hell because Grave has a fucking gross guitar tone on like every fucking album. This one I think took more time with song building, atmosphere, groove, like there's a lot of different elements on here. The lead melodies on here are particularly haunting and creepy. Like everything feels like it was performed inside of a dank cave with like dripping whateverness inside of it. The vocals are massive and cavernous. It sounds like some lumbering beast rather than a human. And the more death doom elements really add a lot to it. It makes it more just dark and sinister rather than like hyper aggressive, which was kind of more what they had before. Namely songs like the title track, Nameless Horror, Consumed and Forgotten is absolutely disgusting. I was really impressed with the songwriting turns on here. They added a lot of cool elements on here that, I don't know, like really kind of opened this band's sound up a bit. The piano that leads in Hunger to Devour really sets the mood. And there's a lot of stuff on here about setting the mood before just coming in and just leveling you with sick riffs. And this album is absolutely full of them. In fact, there wasn't a track on here that I didn't like. I would say like the first two kind of feel like more worship and tribute in terms of like that classic Stockholm sound. This feels like a band kind of coming into their own, still, you know, definitely latching on to that Stockholm sound a bit, but also bringing in some different influences and opening it up a bit. Honestly, I kind of wish I reviewed this one because I'm recently sure Jam and John would have dug this too, but uh, I'm glad I'm talking about it now because this is absolutely killer. If you are a big fan of just old school death metal in general, again, a lot of grave too, and maybe just a little bit of that, you know, classic Stockholm sound, definitely check this out. This is an absolutely sick release. I'm definitely going to be jamming this a lot in the future. The Inquisitor, Apotheosis. This is the latest album from this Danish death metal act. I've been a fan of these guys for a while. I think the only full length I'm missing is their very first one. I was a huge fan of their last EP, Humanoid, which, oddly enough, that's the name of the first track on here. Probably some cool continuation in terms of themes or whatever. But uh, yeah, this is, once again, brutal, dissonant, ugly, very similar to like Morbid Angel, Hate Eternal. I will say this is notable shift in terms of production on here. This is way more murky and muddy, like it sounds more underproduced like the guitars 
don't have a tremendous amount of compression on them and they sound more metallic, more, you know, just dirty sounding versus their other albums where they sound way tighter, more compressed, but they still sound murky. This sounds just kind of raw. Honestly, I would even say it has like a more 90s death metal style production. Like there's a lot of stuff on here that kind of reminds me of, you know, the earlier albums from Immolation and Incantation in terms of like the overall vibe. And it kind of works with the atmosphere in terms of like building some suspense or like setting a more dark and creepy mood, especially on songs like Striving for Destruction and Auto Psychopathy. It kind of gives them an even more sinister sound. Plus you have these deep roared vocals on here, which feel a little bit more pushed back in the mix. And I will say like, this might be a little bit more technical in spots like, well, the eponymous track, uh, The Inquisitor, which is kind of odd to have it like this late in your career to have that sort of track. Anyway, a uh, little bit more technical flair to the riffs. Again, you know, more similar to like Hate Eternal, I would say, but there's even some faster moments in here that are like a little bit more thrashy that would say are kind of comparable to Deicide, again, with different production. And the song Reflected by the Void, I think is particularly catchy with the fun off time groove, though I think it kind of fades out at an odd point. Like it feels like there's going to be more song, like it's gonna transition to another sick breakdown or a lead run or something like that. And then it just kind of slowly fades out. This is a really good album. I don't know if I necessarily like this different style of production overall. When they're playing faster and doing more technical stuff, it kind of gets muddied up a little bit. But when they're doing the slower, more atmospheric stuff, it kind of works in making it sound more sinister. So I don't know, like finding a happy medium overall between the two would probably do it for me at least. But I mean, if you like old school 90s death metal production and you like it particularly raw, and overall, if you like the style of 90s death metal, this band right here definitely fucking has it. I recommend pretty much anything by this band, but I recommend this one too. This is another solid album in their discography. They don't really have a weak album. I assume their first one's good. I'm just gonna kind of bank on that, even though I haven't got it yet or even listened to it. I'm just gonna go ahead and say it's probably awesome. But yeah, if you like Hate Eternal, Morbid Angel, shit like that, definitely check this out. Funebraum, or Funebraum, I'm not entirely sure how to say this band's name, but we have their second album, The Sleep of Morbid Dreams. This is the second album from this New Jersey death metal act. Over the course of its existence, it has featured current former members of Dysma, Cathelist, Vrenth, and even Void Ceremony. Now, this band only has two full lengths, and they're kind of known for putting a lot of space in between them. In fact, their debut came out in 2001, and this one came out in 2009. And I have been trying to hunt down copies of their albums for a while because the stuff I've jammed by them sounded incredible, and I finally got my hands on their second album, and holy shit, this album is awesome. This is intensely brutal, and it's almost like a bridge between bands like Incantation and Bloodbath. There's a little bit of that HM2 sort of just extra buzzsaw grime, but a little bit of that Death Doom sound as well. Lots of great melodies on here too, surprisingly for as brutal as it is. Especially on songs like Grave Reaper, Cursed Eternity, and Next Monumentum. Those songs are surprisingly melodic for as brutal as they are. And when this band gets brutal, it's not only a death metal style of brutality, there's even elements of like grind or death grind on here, especially on songs like Beyond Recognition and Among the Exiled. Those songs are absolutely fucking ferocious. The production on here is flat out brutal as hell. This is very guitar dominated, even though the drums are particularly punchy on here and the vocals are just nasty fucking roars. The guitars in here are just so thick and chunky and aggressive. Like everything about this album is aggressive, even at its more melodic moments or it's more doomy moments. It just feels hostile. But the main thing I love in here are riffs. Oh my God, the riffs in here are so fucking good. Again, aggressive, but there's a lot of nuance to them. Again, melody squeezed in there, different kinds of brutality, atmosphere. Like, it's pretty much a complete fucking package. I was fortunate enough to find this in uh, Pulverized Distro. Apparently, uh, Cyclone Empire reissued this one last year, so I still need to find the first album. But again, I've been trying to hunt down some uh, Funerbram or Funerbram, again, however the hell you say the band's name, for a long time now. And finally getting this one, super happy, because this is just flat out crushing death metal. If you have never jammed this, 
I strongly recommend it if you're an avid death metal fan, if you, again, like stuff like Incantation, Immolation, but also Bloodbath, just check it out. It is front to back, just aggressive as hell. The songs are longer, but they actually, you know, really carry momentum throughout. I love this album. Looking forward to finding the first one uh, whenever I get around to it. But yeah, this is just absolutely brutal as hell and just so damn good. So check it out. All right, we got another split here between Phantasmagore and Flesh Rot. This is their 2020 split, Twisted Visions of Abominations. I've been trying to find this since we reviewed Flesh Rot's debut album. I fucking love that. It's just more awesome, gross Texas death metal. That state is not in any shortage of death metal whatsoever right now, by the way. But I also saw this in Pulverized Distro and I just pounced on it. And this is some pretty nasty shit. First off, Phantasmagore. I thought they were a U.S. band. They are not. They are from Chile. And Chile is also really known for death metal or just extreme metal in general. But these guys play just raw, vicious, ugly, kind of punky death metal. Lots of D beats, very raw guitars and bass on here. It just sounds murky as hell. And they love to pepper in really cool horror samples on here. The opening track, Master Crusher. I'm not sure what movie it's from, but it's definitely a chick running from a slasher and... Judging by all the crunchy, stabby, gooey noises towards the end and her lack of making any noises whatsoever, I don't think she got away. But then the song comes in with just nasty, dirty riffs. Like, it's a lot of, like, autopsy of stuff. They even throw in a bonus cover of Blood Freak, originally done by Necrophagia, and I think that's another band that this band clearly worships. This is very old school. Not a lot of technical play whatsoever. It's just grimy as hell. I have to say, one of my favorite moments on here is when they integrate one of the samples from my favorite horror movie of all time, still The Thing on Assimilation of the Intruder Cell. It was the scene where the uh, older gentleman that uh, carried the gun, oh, God, I forget the character's name, but it was when they were getting ready to do the whole blood test and everything, and he pretty much said he would like to not spend the rest of his stay at the station taped to the fucking couch. That movie is absolutely awesome on just about every fucking front possible, especially the just ridiculously gory, gross special effects. But yeah, they integrate that sample really well, and yeah, I really dug their side. Now, Flesh Rot, I already knew I liked them, and all right. One minor complaint is that they have an intro and an outro to their side of the split, which takes up two tracks. And while they're good, like they're good horror synths and like very much along the lines of like Goblin and like Fulci movies and shit like that, I do feel like they're a little bit extra though. I do love the two songs in here, Twisted Visions Prevail and Bubbling Cerebic uh, Waste. I think I said some of that right. Both excellent songs. Groovy as hell, riffy. The vocals are absolutely sick. The dude hams it up so much. I love it. And the riffs are just pure death metal glory. But for a split, like having an intro and an outro just seems like a bit much. But overall, this is sick. Like this is just some really gross death metal from two very different places that are known for really solid death metal. So if you've never checked out the split, both bands rule. Definitely check it out. And I'm um, looking forward to finding anything more by both of these bands in the future. So yeah, check it out. Sequestrum, Pickled Preservation EP. This is the first EP from this Danish, uh, I guess you could call it super group of Death Grind or Gore Grind. Features members of Frontalith, Chaotian, and Undergang or Undergang. I call them Undergang. I don't know, it just sounds more fun. But uh, yeah, this is some absolutely rotten, filthy, early carcass worship. It is absolutely sick and gross. The production, murky and filthy. Like, this is the kind of carcass worship that does not venture past Symphonies of Sickness one fucking bit. This is first two albums. I would even say more along the lines of Reek of Putrefaction at times. You have blast beats, grindy guitars that just sound like they were immersed in fucking human soup or something like that. And vocals, well, I mean, if you have members of Undergang on there, you're going to have some deep, gurgly vocals. The gutturals on here sound like a walrus gargling raw sewage. They are flat out disgusting, but that is what I've come to expect in terms of like Undergang in general. But as foul and rancid and as rotten as this is, it's really quite catchy and... Uh, Kind of creative. The song Human Broth actually features a 
almost southern rock tinged breakdown with a fucking cowbell on it and it really works like the transition is just kind of wild like you go from just straight up gore grind to I don't know, like almost like a ZZ Top riff with a fucking cowbell on it. And I love the doomy melodies that are on Preserve to Last. And generally you don't talk much about melodies when it comes down to gore grind, which, yeah, no, I totally get why it's fucking gore grind. They don't necessarily belong there for the most part. But they are surprisingly catchy. And I mean, of course, because it's gore grind, you have to have fun with some song titles. Like the one that really stands out to me is Necromucophagia, which I think that is eating corpse snot, I think. God, I hope it's not. That is really fucking gross. But again, Gore Grind, it's supposed to be. And I do love the track Guts simply because it's almost like a nod to You Suffer. It is, well, four seconds long in terms of the track, but the music might be, I don't know, just as long as You Suffer. But yeah, it's a fun nod and fun is the main thing on here. This is just disgusting, gross fun. It is a obvious tribute to you know, early Carcass and any band that has definitely just followed that sound throughout their career. It's gross, it's grimy, but again, it's surprisingly catchy and you know, kind of creative for something that is known to be just primal and, well, gross. I liked the demo that Headsplit sent us, but honestly, this is a lot better. Production's not much cleaner, but I just think the songs are Again, just a little bit more inventive and a little bit more fun. If you love Early Carcass and you love over-the-top, ridiculous, grind-oriented stuff, definitely check this band out, especially this release. This is just foul fucking fun, so check it out. And finally, we have Gates to Hell. This is their self-titled debut, came out in 2022 on Maggot Stomp Records, which, honestly, I haven't seen a lot of stuff come out on Maggot Stomp here lately just because it seems like every band that gets on Maggot Stomp, ends up getting signed to a bigger label. But I saw this in a distro, and this is another hardcore meets death metal hybrid. And I use the term full length pretty loosely because this is nine tracks in 17 minutes. I definitely own EPs a lot longer than this. Most of the tracks are under the two minute mark, but surprisingly they feel pretty complete. Like there are sharp transitions from groovy breakdown to like more death metal centric stuff. The pacing is interesting where it opens up as more of a hardcore album and then as it goes on, it kind of shifts more towards the death metal influence. Songs like Bloodlust, Midnight Sacrifice, and Human Extinction, a little bit more death metal centric, like you get some more tremolo riffs, occasionally you get some blast beats, and some pretty cool horror atmosphere kind of spliced in with like chants and cults and shit and some of them and i know they have a segment from henry portrait of a serial killer on here because it's the same sample that nail bomb used all those years ago albeit they cut off a little bit at the end but yeah it's the same one and i mean that movie's pretty damn quotable and fucking disturbing still you get some more brutal death metal slams on fortress of torture it feels like it's kind of a sampler platter of uh, well, just a lot of different extreme things, and for the most part it works really well, though there are songs in here where I feel like they could have extended, you know, just the song itself, because again, a lot of the stuff is like under the two minute mark, and while they pack a punch, I feel like they just kind of shorten down everything, like complete measures, just to fit it inside of these short songs. They're simple, they're primal, they're, you know, heavier than hell, but after a while, the formula kind of got old, and that's kind of rough to say for a 17-minute debut. Now, when I was looking up stuff on this band, it seems like they're only down to two members, and this band, I think, featured like three guitarists at one point, a frontman, bassist, and a drummer, so this was a pretty full band, so I don't know what happened after this release, or maybe before this release, but it seems like this band's got some retooling to do. I think this is decent. You know, it's kind of commonplace in terms of like this death metal meets hardcore style that honestly it's the shit we probably should be calling deathcore but deathcore kind of got named much earlier that is definitely a different discussion though i do think this is good it just feels kind of ordinary especially with all the other bands out there kind of really pushing this sound and doing it arguably better i would definitely check out more by this band though but yeah if you like shit like 200 stab wounds uh, frozen soul creeping death stuff like that gate creeper i'd throw in there too the new cruelty it's right in that vein Definitely check this out. It's a pretty nasty listen. 
All right, that knocks out another one of these. And these are getting difficult to do with this new camera because this thing has a habit of overheating. So there might be some weird edits here and there just because, well, camera overheated. Outside of that though, this camera is pretty awesome. So I can't complain that much, but yeah, uh, in terms of other stuff coming up, uh, probably gonna work on some States of Metal stuff. I am gonna be gone for a little while on a vacation and then not long after I get back, going out for Denver. So in terms of content, it might be a little spotty for a while. I mean, we definitely have plenty of reviews we wanna get in, but that uh, first week of April might be a little bit slower because I'm definitely gonna relax on my vacation. But yeah, if you enjoyed this video, of course, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there is a link down below to thrallsmetal.com. That is our store. Again, we will be reloading on stuff uh, probably after Denver Death Fest. We're kind of toying around with some ideas in terms of merch. We just haven't had time to really implement any of them because Denver's kind of taken up a big part of our uh, whole deal here at Thralls. That'll be taking place April 20th through the 22nd in Denver, Colorado because yeah, why Why would it be any place else if it's Denver Death Fest? That wouldn't make any sense. We got 28 bands in this, looking forward to it, you know, hanging out with people, BSing, checking out music. It should be a good time. If you are interested in tickets, there are still some left. For all three days, it is 60 bucks, two days, 45, one day, 25. The link down below will instruct you any further in terms of purchasing them. But yeah, uh, we're looking forward to it. Should be a damn good time. And of course, thank you all so much for liking, subscribing, following, all that shit. It means the world to us. It's awesome to see this channel grow. Got plenty of stuff coming up in the future. Hopefully not long after we get done with Denver, we will get down to that immolation ranking. Looking forward slash dreading that one because like literally I can think of like five of their albums that could be my number one. Too many quality releases. Shame on you, immolation. I'm, I'm just kidding. I love like literally everything you do. But anyway, plenty of stuff coming. And with that, I will thank you one more time because you are all fucking awesome. And we will catch you later.